Welcome to ABA On Call. Join myself, Rick Cabina. Uh, we can, we have so many studies that show if you have a behavior that's followed by a consequence, let's say it's positive, there's an increased likelihood that that's gonna happen in the future. And Doug Kostowitz. We behave differently because it was determined for us. It's not determined for all. For thought-provoking conversation. Hey everybody, would you like to get a CEU for this episode? Listen closely for the announcement of three secret words delivered throughout the episode. Take note of those words and we will tell you where to go to get your CEU when the show is over. Hello everybody and welcome to ABA On Call for another fabulous episode. Wow, fabu- that is a really good adjective, fabulous. Uh, I coined it, so if you're going to use it, you have to cite me. That's Hey, that's good. There you go. I love it. Today we're going to talk about a very interesting topic, which is creativity. And uh, for our viewing audience, we decided, hey, we're going to wear some t-shirts, try to theme it up with creativity. Doug, tell me about your t-shirt and why does it express something involving creativity? Well, I, the way I looked at it was is I like Star Wars and I decided to wear a Star Wars shirt. It's maybe not as popular with the with the less than exciting movies that have happened lately, but I still uh, like Star Wars, so I felt like I was being a little creative in wearing it. Okay. I am wearing a shirt that is, uh, I got a concert from one of my favorite indie bands called Rubble Bucket, and, and when you think about artists and uh, you know, musicians, you think about creativity. And in fact, you know, Doug, when this first segment, we're going to just talk about what do we mean by creativity in general in psychology? You know, psychology has a long history, and even right now, in common parlance, maybe you've heard about this, where people talk about uh, you're creative. You know, so mm-hmm. what is a creative? You know, is a creative an artist? Is it uh, someone who's producing something? And when people now talk about creatives, what they're getting at is about someone who's doing something that's producing something of value. So you're right. creative and it can express itself in mm-hmm. different ways. And that term fits a lot of people now. Right. So I guess the way I understand it, coming from a, a sort of a general perspective, for something to be creative, it sort of has an originality aspect and it has a function, uh, fun functionality aspect. So originality for something to be creative, it's going past something that's already happened. It's not necessarily just an extension. It's something different where it still maintains some level of usefulness or it's doing things better than we could do it before. Now, Thinking about it from that perspective is easy to see that in certain fields, but in others, such as maybe paintings, etc., that notion of functionality is a little different, right? It still functions perhaps as some type of expression of art, but it doesn't necessarily, isn't necessarily usefulness in the same sense as maybe a technology would be. I think that's a good way of describing creativity if we talked if we if we asked people we we're just having a conversation uh, at a coffee house or at a bar and we're, we're just chatting up creativity that gets at a lot of the elements of what do people mean when we talk about creativity like you and I when we immediately think about it you're thinking along this this storytelling and everything else that's involved in the storytelling. When we were talking about the cinema, there's a lot of moving parts there. And uh, when I think about musicians and how do they come up with uh, lyrics, riffs with the musical instruments they're playing, it fits that definition. When we look at, so, so let's just go with that. Creativity mm-hmm. involves those two elements 
And the question is, you know, how do we get this? I mean, if I, I guess there's two things we could do. Number one, could we have an argument, is creativity a useful phenomenon? Mm -hmm. What would you answer that? Well, I think it, most definitely it is. Uh, creativity, I guess, can be labeled after the fact or before the fact, but you may, so individuals may do something throughout history and it could be then labeled creative after the fact, which may improve the entirety of mankind, or it may be something that just is better for yourself. Uh, but the idea is, is doing something different and then getting the label of that creative notion yeah i that that's well said creativity in a society is essential mm -hmm. and we'll, we'll dig a little bit deeper here into what does psychology mean by creativity but just being able to produce solutions or and, and that can manifest itself in different ways on the problem side problem solving side heck we want creativity when it comes to dealing with viruses or any health impairment or technology or any way of bettering us. And then you know, there's, we could look at the humanity side. We can look at artistry and all the different ways that breaks out. I mean, there's just so much that we could benefit as a society from creatives and people who can show creativity. So what, what then, as, as we're looking at from that, what can more likely generate quote unquote creative instances? What are some of the, the founding, or what would say the characteristics of individuals that from this psychological perspective would then generate creative outcomes? There... One that I can see right off the bat, or at least that is suggested as, is sort of a discipline to a field. Right? Yeah. And then, of course, you have what what suggested is then the intelligence within that field, and then yeah. sort of a what they've defined as an energy, a wanting to do more things within that field. So again, this is limiting to um, from a psychological perspective. What generates these creative behaviors are sort of the combination of these factors. It has been a slog in psychology to try to figure out how does creativity happen. I, when I, I wrote a paper on this, which you know, we'll share, and when I was doing research for that, you know, early on there was a psychologist called Lewis Terman, and what he did is he followed these children who were genius level, and uh, he gave them these little brooches and they loved each other and they called each other termites and you know he followed them he did this in this very sophisticated longitudinal study and as you pointed out uh, people for many years have thought you have to be intelligent to be creative mm -hmm. well when Terman died someone wrote an obituary about him and said you know for all the work that Terman did when you look at all of his genius children Sure, maybe they were they they were all employed and maybe they were uh, a little better paid, but you know, there weren't any university presidents. There weren't any actors. There weren't any scientists who were discovering these incredible things. So yes, intelligence is something, but it's a lot more than that when we talk about creativity. And psychology has you know, come up with all kinds of ways of trying to describe it. And frankly, Doug, I don't know about you, but I'm not happy with any of the things that I read from general psychology. Some mm -hmm. of it is psychobabble. You know, when you start talking about energies and these mm -hmm. things that we can't even wrap our heads around, that's going to help nobody. Sure, it might, you as the person who's writing it, people might be like, ooh, this person has something figured out. But you sure as hell aren't going to be able to apply that to anybody replicate it, generate it, moving forward. It's almost everything's announced after the fact. That's why I mentioned earlier, labeling things as creative is almost easier than 
generating those creative outcomes. And this is another case of it's easy to look at someone who generated what we would call creative outcomes to look back and say, oh, they, they, they had all these things going. And so it was all these characteristics that went into that creative performance. But then when that doesn't happen for the next creative performance, that's when everything starts to break down as to what you are getting from that. And then, of course, the, uh, from a psychological perspective, they further clarify creative behaviors to cer certain levels. Right. And those levels are, you know, they, there's four right now, if you want to share those with the audience. Sure. Uh, you know, they'll, people talk about creativity, and just as you said, they'll label creativity. So you mm -hmm. have mini C, little C, pro C, and big C. Mm -hmm. And without going into what all that means, the big C is where you, know, you are creating this thing that's incredible. You know, everyone's like, wow, that's the top of the top. You know, you just have this amazing artistic uh, art piece of art. You may have this uh, formula that you just, you know, you're Einstein and you just discovered this thing. Whereas, you know, if it's like a mini C, this is just something that could be meaningful in your life that, that you did. Like, hey, you know, you're a mom and you learned uh, th this new way of, uh, you know, doing whatever it is. And you know, maybe you're working with your child and you have a new way of, uh, or mom or dad, you know, you've heard a new way of uh, disciplining your kids or whatever, you know, mini C. So, yes. Uh, psychologists have issues with how do they define it? Cause you can find all kinds of variability there. And then of course, how you label it and what all that means. Well, actually, before we go any further, I want to give you the first word for those that are listening. And the first word is big C. Well, with the big C, let's move on and talk about the big ABA. Oh man, mm -hmm. that's a bad joke. <laughs> or how about just behavior analysis? Thank you. We'll go with okay. that. Our this is why I love our science. Uh, it is a it start Skinner started off behavior analysis as a natural science, and you know, with with things like uh, you know we've learned so much, but with things like creativity, where we we haven't spent as much time in that area so you don't find a lot of information uh, on creativity but that doesn't mean nobody has looked at it and it doesn't mean that we don't have people who've talked about it we don't have people who've written about it we don't have people uh you know who have done experiments on this and you know skinner did spend some time talking about creativity and to, to bring this down and nutshell it, what creativity is, number one, is it's novelty. And when we can understand that it's novelty, number two is what does the verbal community say about that novelty? And this, this isn't too far from what we were just talking about, how psychologists talked about, you know, mini C up to big C. We do the same thing. If you have novelty and we understand, this is the thing about uh, our science, is we can understand the sources of those novelty. And then as a, you know, community, uh, a verbal community, because we understand the sources of those novelty, we're likely to deem some behaviors as not creative and some behaviors as creative. By how we provide reinforcement or withhold reinforcement or provide punishment. It's selection by consequences. But it gets back to similar to what, like you said, psychology is judging it after the fact. Well, it's not judged as whatever. It's how they respond to it. And then how they, because you could quote, be, perform a novel quote unquote creative behavior that goes unnoticed, that doesn't make things easier for you, that doesn't meet with any consequences, that fades out of that situation because you have to go back and do something different. I think about athletes 
uh, and they there's so a person begins to do some different dribble that goes to the hole a little bit it goes to shoot but if a turnaround through the legs just never happens to them it may be judged creative but it'll fade out of the repertoire because it doesn't end with them completing a shot or getting uh, making the team or however you want to view it the consequences aren't there for it to be maintained even though it could have been quote unquote a creative novel behavior yeah with creativity understanding it as a process that involves novelty you have a, a a couple things you can a couple ways you can look at this number one there's the generation of behavior that we would want to de deem creative and then number two there would be the maintenance of 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 that behavior and that's something that you just talked about but in in psycho or in behavior analysis you know skinner towards the end of his career was working with one of his doctoral students at the time uh, by someone named Robert Epstein, Epstein. and uh, Epstein, they did these really cool experiments where they worked with pigeons. And the, maybe uh, if you recall from your introductory psychology courses, and maybe some of our listeners will remember this from the intro psych classes, but uh, in Gestalt, psychology, there is this um, famous study where, uh, and I can't even remember who the guy's name was, but he was trapped on an island in World War II, and how was he working with, with monkeys? And he put this monkey in the cage, and there was a banana, so, <laughs> you know, literally a banana that was hanging. He, he hung the banana from the top of the cage, there were boxes in there, and he would just study, you know, the monkey. And I think the monkey's name was Sultan. And he, he describes this flash of insight where, you know, all of a sudden, you know, Sultan uh, took these boxes and, you know, he pushed it underneath and stood up on it and grabbed the banana. And, you know, this seemingly uh, dramatic experience, uh, dr this dramatic insight this dramatic uh, demonstration of creativity was to show that this gestalt psychology works well guess what here's what skinner and epstein did they took pigeons and they would reinforce they, they would they, they they redid this with pigeons where they had them in a little box you know it wasn't an experimental chamber it was like an open area and they hung this little banana and you know the the pigeon would the pigeons would were taught different behaviors some of the pigeons were taught how to directionally push this little box around another behavior that some of the pigeons were taught were climb up on the box peck the thing and uh then some of the other pigeons were taught uh you know don't jump up and uh, or don't try to fly and, and tap the thing. Through their experiments, what they found was that all of the pigeons that had those three elements could figure out this incredible task where they would push the box, climb up on top of it, and peck the disc. In other words, they use behavior analysis to show the seemingly creative behavior that was mm -hmm. there you know, the, the result of these gestalt forces, which who the hell knows what those are. Well, I think what you're getting at is exactly when you're likely to see creative performance, and that's by individuals who can perform the necessary behaviors at a level that is strong enough that they can do those creative behaviors or they're they're displaying those element behaviors to some level that they can perhaps get to that point. So again, a, you know, an easy example is, doesn't matter about me, I, I can't dribble, I can't 
do ba- I can't play basketball. Come on, Doug. But, you got game and we all uh, Hey, it. no, I don't. But the point is, I can do some basics, but I'm unlikely under certain situations to demonstrate the same creativity that individuals who play that game better overall will. And even if I happen to fall into it once, I'm unlikely to be able to replicate it because I don't have the skills to do that. So when you think, when you go past that and you think about those, those pigeons, you think about that monkey that probably learned lots of behaviors over time and then there was that next moment. It wasn't that next moment before it was well after they've tried all these other things. So, and that holds true for any of these creative behaviors. So if you're thinking about um, writing, writing just doesn't, someone doesn't just have the, the best novel, the most creative novel ever. They have to be able to write. They have to be able to write a sentence. They have to be able to do all these behaviors that lead into that. So I think that's a further example of, exa- of what you're pointing out. There, there are so many instances of what you're saying, and you can break this down into discrete skills or you know these these larger you know multi-step uh, skills, and they're all going to rely on your history of reinforcement, and they're going to rely on you know, multiple behaviors. Like I think about. You know, we grew up uh, watching Michael Jordan. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, if you're a basketball fan, and depending on how long you've been around, but you know, I-, I can still recall, you know, when Michael Jordan would just when he did that one where he switched his hands and he went under, and everyone was going nuts over how incredible that was. You and I could never do that because even though, like you point out, even though we we make you know have some basic skills we don't have all of the past experience that level where we can where these these behaviors were would converge and create this incredible novel behavior oh my goodness it's time for word number two that was a good prompt rick and the word number two is novelty novelty so if you're listening for ceus the second word is novelty and that is if you're interested in creativity how will you implement it as a behavior analyst? You know, how can you program for creativity? Now, we have you know, small segments here. There's a lot to this, but right. hopefully with our conversation, if you're interested in this, you know, we can spur some thinking and we can help you decide, well, how could you enhance creativity in your children? And you know, who, what parent or what teacher or, you know, sports coach or whomever doesn't want creativity and we can do it in our field right well i think one of the first ways is using imitation to um have the learner see others demonstrating novel behaviors and then they get to quote replicate or they they would imitate that so then it would set the stage that that person would and it doesn't have to just be a younger person that's just learning to imitate, but uh, I'm thinking about uh, kids who watch others play games, whether it's lacrosse, basketball, and they go out and they try those two-handed layups that you said that Jordan showed us the first time. Well, now the stuff that kids are doing now are even past that. So using that imitation to your advantage to set the stage for imparting those novel behaviors might be a good first start. Yeah, and uh, we have many sources of novelty, and or not not novelty, many sources of uh, or procedures that generate novelty. And if you like, let's say that I was uh, an artist and I had this amazing painting. If you just started imitating what I was doing and someone saw you imitating, they're not going to call you a creative because mm-hmm. it's very obvious where that source of novelty is coming from. Coming from. Still though, you cannot pass up that 
That's part of everyone's repertoire. And if you don't have imitation as a basic skill, right. to forget about advancing in anything because you're not just going to whip something up magically. Whatever product, whatever behavior you're interested in, in creating or uh, whatever product you're interested in creating, whatever behavior you're interested in, in, in growing into a creative behavior, imitation is a core behavior that you have to have to produce novelty. I think another one that, uh, you know, in our limited time is, and we've talked about this before, but frequency building of element skills. And if you continue to work and have whatever those basic skills are, I'm thinking different chords within uh, music, if you know all your scales and you know all your chords, if you don't have to think about those types of things, then you begin then you can perhaps you're so fluent that you begin to try some different things out and you may meet with those contingencies that'll produce novel behavior or i mean that will reinforce novel behavior and that can be judged as creative yeah frequency building or what other people call practice you know, we call it frequency building because we put a very clear explanation as to what frequency building is, that is going to solidify your skills in your repertoire because if you those skills aren't solidified, if they're not able to just happen at a, a moment's notice, what's the likelihood that you know, when you're playing a game, when you're creating, when you're doing whatever, that that's just gonna happen? And uh, I, I think that's very important to understand. When we talk about different techniques, uh, we have basic techniques and then we have more advanced techniques. Mm -hmm. And some other basic techniques that, so we talked about imitation, frequency building uh, is also something, but let's just talk about you know, instructions. Mm -hmm. like we can just literally give instructions to people to help with Variability, or um, excuse me, not variability. That was the next thing I was going to talk about. <laughs> I'm actually thinking ahead. Uh, so that people don't have to figure things out. Right. It's there for them. And I'll say if you're going to instruct or if you're going to set all these things, you need to be there, a discerning eye, so that you can provide feedback and catch those instances of create, you know, novel behavior to immediately provide some type of effective reinforcer so that it can begin to get established in that individual's repertoire and strengthened. So you not only have to instruct, but you have to all this be that verbal community so that you're there ready. And it, maybe it takes shaping and you can begin to shape that performance until you get, um, until you get what you wanna see. Doug, I'm so glad you said reinforcement. Okay. I think back to two studies that I read in the past. One was uh, like a 1969 study by Karen Pryor, and she reinforced variability in dolphins. Mm -hmm. And what she simply did is, like if the dolphin would do a, you know, a, a trick or a novel behavior, it would receive reinforcement. But when the dolphin did that same thing, it wouldn't receive reinforcement again. It had to do something slightly different. And what she found out through that study is you can create all of this amazing novelty with reinforcement. There was another classic study by Don Bear, and I forget who else he did it with, but they worked with children who were toddlers and they were creating blocks. And guess what they did? They only provided reinforcement for new block structures. Guess what the kids did? They started creating all of these amazing block structures mm -hmm. and it was all because of reinforcing variability. Yep. Uh, I, I would also uh, like to point out that you know, with variability, there's lots of ways you could uh, induce variability. You certainly can reinforce it, but if you just apply extinction to something, you tend to get variability. And you know, there, in our literature, there are lots of ways of, of using these different techniques of, 
of creating novelty. But I, will, I wanted to spend this last segment talking about some of the, the big ideas where you know, how do we start accounting for these dramatic instances of, of uh, behavior. And I'm just going to name three. Okay. How can we account for novelty that is very impressive? Stimulus equivalents, interconnection of repertoires, that's what Epstein and Skinner talked about, and then uh, this thing called contingency adduction. And that's a little less well known, but it is in the literature, mm -hmm. and each one of those processes are very, uh, those are ways to account for very dramatic occurrences of novel behavior. Contingency adduction is something that I did my dissertation on, mm -hmm. so this is something that I'm very familiar with. And it gets back to what you were saying, right. where if uh, you, might, you might do frequency building, that can help, but if you have something in your repertoire that is very prominent, then all of a sudden you might see it. And right. that adduction of these contingencies that come together to form this new behavior can only happen if those behaviors are in your repertoire at some strength where it can be recruited by the contingencies in the environment. Right. That's, that's the, I mean, that's the critical aspect. I mean, you can't lose, you can't lose the contingencies and often those contingencies are other people, but not all the time. Sometimes it's how you, solve like you mentioned earlier how you solve a problem you can be created with that but it's it's got to be picked up it's got to be judged successful enough or for you to then display that novel creative behavior and you know it's it's exciting to think about that we can we can kind of explain some things that others can't and our science does a good job with that yeah. Now, with that, Doug, I would point out we got a far way to go. Mm -hmm. We don't have a lot of people studying creativity and you know, novelty. What people talk about is generativity. It's fascinating, and it's my hope that when we talk about this, that you know we've excited some people who might consider looking into this more and maybe trying to adapt some of these procedures that are out there in the literature and start producing what we would determine as creativity with their own uh, people that they work with. So our third word is fluency. So uh, for those listening, the third word is fluency. That's a good word. It fits in the theme of what we've been talking about. Well, Doug, that was a very fun conversation. To all of our listeners, thank you for listening to us, and we look forward to talking with you again on the next issue or episode of ABA On Call. Thanks for watching this episode of ABA On Call. To get your CEU, follow the link and instructions below the video. You can enjoy the program again there, or you can go straight to the attendance verification quiz. Just enter the secret words and pay the CEU fee to generate your certificate.